those lines. Thanks, Alexis. Hi, everyone. Tonight's conversation is going to be a little different. Last year I did the top six upgrades you could do, and I talked about a lot of cognitive enhancement things, including some of the things that you just heard from Jonathan, who is someone I very much respect. Uh, the dual impact training is powerful stuff. But tonight we're going to talk about how you can upgrade some of your biological functions using some simple things like salt, butter, and coffee. <laughs> I swear this thing worked a minute ago. This is very bad. Since every slide has builds, like there's a major issue. And there's a little thing spinning that's even worse. Because we need a button pusher. There we go. Excellent. It's doing them all at once, but we're good. Alright. So biohacking is the art and the science of controlling your own biology using stuff we have now. Let's see if this keeps working. Oh, did you already swap? Oh. Thank you. Using your own biology and using modern stuff, which can include understandings of biochemistry, things about psychology, neurology, neuroscience, and everything else out there, as well as systems thinking about the body and its interaction with the environment around you, in order to basically be stronger, faster, sexier, all that kind of stuff. I used to weigh 300 pounds, and I had cognitive dysfunction in my mid-20s and I don't have those problems anymore. I've slept less than five hours a night for the last two years, 4,500 calories a day, and I've worked out four times in the last two years. This is just what biochemistry does. Also, yesterday, my version of dual in-back software with some other cognitive training stuff went live for free on the Android store. If you have an Android device, go for it, well, your mindware, and you can compare it with Jonathan's excellent software. And it's working. Let's look at salt, which has been maligned for a very long time. Theodore Roosevelt said some very important words here. Are you worth your salt? So why would we ask if a man was worth his salt, or a woman, as the case may be, if there wasn't something special about salt? Nelson Mandel, another one. Why would he not salt for all? Did he not like his people? Or did he know something that we forgot in the US? And I went to a higher power. <laughs> God likes salt, and he doesn't like eggs. <laughs> and then finally, little of me has salt is good. So let's get into the claims for salt here. Salt increases hypertension, causes high blood pressure, right? We've all heard this. Strokes, heart attacks, it's all bad. It's a poison. I love reading on the internet. You can read anything. <laughs> You should sharply reduce your sodium intake, and there's just no evidence for this stuff. And I'll talk with you about why there's no evidence and why we believe this today. 1979, our government's famous, especially in the US, for doing this. They make a statement, and then they're like, oh god, there's no evidence, but we better not have been wrong. So they published this statement, and we all believe it today. It was based on some rat studies and some understandings about what diuretics do. Going back to the 50s, the salt-sensitive rats they used had to eat the equivalent of 500 grams of salt for the human body. <laughs> Hello. In 1984, with the Intersalt study, which was meant to prove that the Surgeon General is never wrong, 10,000 subjects, 52 global locations, Look, average blood pressure goes up if you eat more. So we know the government's right, but it was 1984, see? <laughs> Here's what actually happens. This is the data in the Intersalt study. Wait, blood pressure drops when you eat more salt? In Chicago, where people had the lowest salt intake, they had the highest blood pressure. And in China, in one of the provinces where they ate the most salt, they had almost no high blood pressure. Hmm. How is it that they looked at this weird average number in the first one to make sure they were right, even though the data didn't say that? Politics over science. So in 1999, they said, we better prove this again. And they did the NHANES study, which was actually sponsored by uh, the guys who make underwear. <laughs> 21,000 people studied since 1971, all this lovely data. Look at this. 
highest salt intake, they have more strokes, and they die more, and they're bad people, they didn't go to church. Well, that's the study. Is it just where I'm standing? I keep losing my ability to forward slides. It's too much salt. <laughs> I don't know. I think something else is gone too. Computers normally don't freeze like this, but I think it did. Yeah. Well, this will be a fun talk if I do it from memory, but I can because I've hacked my memory sensibly. <laughs> there it goes. No idea what it's doing at. So I'm like, yeah, give it a try. There we go. That's what they actually found. This is the data. Don't be fat. And they found that those risks, all those bad things that were published, only happened if you were already obese. So they were selectively mining the data. There was not a correlation if you looked at people who were not obese. So they mine the data and they bake the analysis to meet the conclusion that was politically expedient. And you've been told ever since then, don't eat salt, which is hurting your performance as a human being. And since what I'm here to do is to help people perform better, that's bad. The study itself wasn't even designed to study study. As a matter of fact, all that data that you just heard was based on, they interviewed these people all the way back from 1971. They asked them one time, how much salt did you have in the last day? How many of you can tell me how much salt you had today? Two people, excellent. The rest of you, you just lied. Or made it up, which is why this data is a bunch of crap. So let's look at like what a real scientist would do. Like, this is my Baldwin guy. The president of the American Society for Hypertension, an epidemiologist. He looked at the data and said, hmm, uh-oh. The more salt you eat, the less likely you are to die. By the way, I've been eating 10 grams of salt a day for the past eight years. And this is going to drive me nuts. Solid state disk drive, 16 gigs of RAM, and this is what happens. So let's look at what salt actually does. This guy looked at people with a little bit of hypertension, not people who are like super obese. He looked at actually what you pee out rather than what you thought you might have eaten in the day before. And after four years, the people with the lowest sodium had the most heart attacks, and basically they died more. That's bad. So if you're limiting your salt, you're doing that to yourself right now. You actually need salt. You know, sodium, potassium, that whole pump thing that your cells do, it's kind of important. <laughs> Low sodium diets, this is by the way, all Journal of the American Medical Association studies that they've published themselves in the last 20 years. So it increases levels of renin, we'll talk about renin in a minute, increases insulin resistance, oh, if you're a man, it's the opposite of your Viagra, cognitive difficulties, I don't like those, food without salt tastes crappy, <laughs> and diuretics have all the same side effects, they lower sodium. So we know that if you take sodium out of people who are mostly bags of salty water anyway, this is what happens. Meet renin. Most of us haven't heard of it, but renin actually raises your blood pressure, and 2% more renin equals 25% more heart attacks. In case it's not really clear, you eat less salt, your renin goes up, your renin goes up, you get heart attacks, eat more salt. So, there's no evidence here. You'll get 83 studies and meta-analysis, and it shows you this. High blood pressure people, low salt has very low effects. In normal blood pressure people, it's even less. And get this, the margin of error for that little cuff they use is five. So we're dealing with trivial differences. They don't matter. Eat the amount of salt that tastes good to your taste buds and you'll do, you'll do good things for yourself. And maybe take some potassium and some magnesium too. Most people are deficient in those. But it's not about lowering sodium. Now, we're going to go to the next subject, which is coffee, but I just want to show you this. This is the latest stuff from CNN within the last year. They're still telling you to do things despite what the science tells us. 
coffee's the next topic. All right, I'm getting a, I'm getting a doll. That's it. <laughs> well, let's talk coffee. If this doesn't go in a minute, there it goes. Let's talk about coffee beliefs. Dissolves your bones. It's bad for you. It gives you headaches. Causes insulin resistance. Oh, the acidic thing. And it's addictive. I admit it, coffee's addictive. Let's look at what it actually does for your health. Better glucose tolerance, the opposite of insulin resistance there. 50% lower incidence in type 2 diabetes. It's shown to not cause osteoporosis. By the way, those little numbers correlate to studies. I'll put this all on the website with links to these. These are all PubMed studies. You live longer if you drink coffee. If you're in the US, you get more antioxidants from coffee than anywhere else if you're an average person. You have less chance of prostate cancer if you're a man, and a 100% guarantee of no prostate cancer if you're a woman. <laughs> and uh, likewise, if you're a woman, you have less likelihood of being stressed, sorry, of being depressed or dying. This is why a cup of coffee in the morning might be a good idea. Here's what it does for your performance. Coffee in China actually was shown to produce the same physiological changes as doing Qigong. I'm not saying it's a replacement for Qigong, I'm just saying it's not a bad thing for you. Short-term memory goes up. You perform better when you're exercising. You lose fat. And this is something that very few people know about. One of the reasons coffee is one of my favorite biohacks. In order to build muscle, the way we do that is we inhibit something called mTOR, which is the mammalian target of rampomycin receptor. I think I got a word in the middle there backwards. What mTOR does is mTOR is it stops muscle building and it sort of builds up a pressure like a spring. So when you exercise, you don't build muscle at all. It's after you exercise that you stop inhibiting this that you start building muscle. Coffee, exercise, and fasting are the three things that will most suppress mTOR so it springs back hardest. One of the reasons I look like I do is that I use a combination of two of those three things regularly. Coffee and intermittent fasting, which is called bulletproof fasting, it actually makes you grow muscles without exercising. There's a coffee picture. But here's the problem. 91.7% of this year's coffee has toxic mold growing in it, according to public studies. That's moldy coffee. There's something called biogenic amines. The one you've heard about the most is actually called histamine. Histamine causes allergies. There are other ones, like tyramine and tryptamine, that actually have cognitive effects, and this happens depending on how the coffee is processed and how it's aged. So if you drink coffee and you get sore joints or you get a headache or you feel crabby, the reason is actually not because of coffee, it's because of mycotoxins from mold or it's because of biogenic enemies. Decaf, slight problem, caffeine's an antifungal. You pull the decaf out of the bean, it's gonna go bad even faster. Don't drink decaf, it's a sin. Here's what happens when you drink moldy coffee. You feel jittery and anxious, that bad coffee feeling. You get stress in your adrenal glands. You get headaches, and you get muscle soreness. You also pee a lot. So if you drink coffee and it makes you have to pee the next 20 minutes and you pee all day long, you have only coffee. That's what happened to you. It's not anything else. So how do you hack your coffee for the most mental performance? That's my two minute warning. Right? From a bean perspective, you want to get mechanically processed beans if you can find them. 2% of coffee is processed from mechanical processing. That means no fermentation was used to remove the outer layer of the cherry. If you can't find that, you can get wet processed coffee, which means they ferment the outside of the cherry. You want single origin, meaning it came from one place instead of a hundred places. That means you'll have less chance of there being an insect infestation that introduced mold to your coffee. You want high altitude, you want Central American because coffee from Central America has less mold than African coffee. You want caffeine in your coffee. And then you want to brew it. There's two ways you can choose to brew it, two of these classifications of ways. Choose a paper filter-based way. You get all the antioxidants in coffee, but it removes these two substances, capistrol and cowahol. Those substances will raise your cholesterol by about 15%, your LDL cholesterol. I'm not particularly worried about LDL cholesterol. I don't think it's that important. But if you're worried about that, you might want to paper filter your coffee. Or you use a metal filter or espresso. What happens there is those two substances are actually very potent anti-inflammatories, particularly in the brain, and they quench reactive oxidative species like peroxynitrite. 
And you may actually feel a noticeable difference in your mental performance from unfiltered versus filtered coffee. And if you want to make your coffee bulletproof, you take low toxin coffee and you blend it in a blender with grass-fed butter and something called MCT oil that's extracted from coconut oil. It's the same stuff as putting cream in your coffee, but it has more of some of the special things butter has in it. When you do that, you'll have stable, really good energy that lasts all morning long. We're talking, you have this at 7 a.m., you won't get hungry until 2 p.m., and there's no energy dip, and you don't want a snack. How many people here have tried bulletproof coffee? That's a good portion, and how many of you thought it was not a useful way of feeling good in the morning? It's, it's unanimous. Bulletproof coffee rocks. <laughs> That's my daughter. <laughs> that was a Christmas present. First time she sat on Santa's lap, she said, what do you want, little girl? And she said, I want my own stick of salted butter. <laughs> She's my daughter. We have one minute, so we're going to go through the butter facts fast. Saturated fat hasn't been proven to cause heart disease. That's one of those things like salt. Trans fat is bad. Butter actually is better than vegetable oil. And Vitamin K2 that's present, especially in grass-fed butter, is very protective. But there's some secret butter powers that no one's told you about. <laughs> How many of you have heard of butyrate? Sweet, look at that, like five people. So butyrate is a very short-chain fatty acid. It's actually the second shortest-chain fatty acid there is that's fully saturated. And it's only present in cream and most in cultured butter, about 4% of the fat in butter is there. It's not present anywhere else in nature that we know about, except maybe in your guts. In humans, this is what it does. It's a very potent anti-inflammatory. It heals and protects the gut and the brain. It inhibits NF-kappa beta, which is an inflammatory compound. It heals your gut, and the two places you can get it are butter, or you can get it if you have the right species of bacteria growing in your gut, and they ferment fiber. Of course, whether you have the right species and whether they're fermenting properly is highly variable based on lots of factors, that some of which are outside your control. In rats and mice, and probably people, it also protects against mental illness, increases energy expenditure, and improves body composition. I don't have the study referenced here, but it also dramatically lowers your cholesterol, and it causes very rapid fat loss, even faster than medium-chain triglycerides, which are also part of bulletproof coffee. And if you have type 1 diabetes, it reduces the negative effects of this. So this is really a magic substance that's why you should eat real butter. Here's how to pick the right butter. Grass-fed, because it has conjugated linoleic acid, which has all sorts of <coughs> relatively well-known effects. You need cultured butter. This is actually hard to find, because that has the most butyrate. Any butter has butyrate, but grass-fed cultured is best. If you do that, you're going to get more omega-3s, more beta carotene, all the oxidant, all the antioxidants and other vitamins that you'd like, and it tastes better. That was everything that I had to tell you. Final point here. Afterwards, in the middle, I'm doing a shit biohackers say video that will go on YouTube. If you would like to be featured saying something like, do these electrodes make my buzz look fat? I would like to videotape you in the back. Yeah, at the end of the conference, of course. And also, I have coupons that are scattered around. If you want to try the Bulletproof Upgraded Coffee stuff, I'm giving a discount to anyone who's at Bill. And it's one of those things, once you try it, you won't go back. That's it. Thank you all very much.